All right. Here we go again. <laughs> hey. Suddenly, I feel like there's a harmonica in my house. Um, <laughs> oh, anyway, they have, they have so we got a great we got a great guest today. He's so anxious; he's already performing. Um, and I've known I've known Louis Merlino for quite some time from his band Beggars and Thieves back in New York City. He's had an amazing career as a session singer, uh, and so he's got tons of great stories to tell. So let's uh, welcome Louis. Let's get right to it. Louis, how you doing? Good. How you doing? I'm doing good. Normally, I'd ask people, you know, thanks for making time in your busy schedule, but of course, you're not doing anything. Good day. I'm open today. <laughs> yeah. We found a small window to get this done. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Louis, well, we're going to, well, you know, obviously, a lot of people know you from Beggars and Thieves. Um, in my opinion, Beggars and Thieves is one of those bands that should have been the band that broke through and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, slipped through the cracks. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. I want to start with, you know, Louie, you grew up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, West New York. How about those bills? Hey, you know what? 25 years it's been. That Jack Kemp, man, he's doing a really good job this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No yeah. Scott Norwood now. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's a young kid and he could he could throw the ball. So, it, well, this the, uh, Bills fans are, you know, been waiting a long time. Oh, this could be huge, yeah. Yep. Um, they could take it all away. Yeah. So what well, well, we're going to see, it's it's definitely exciting. But so so Louis, yeah. You know, what when you were living in Buffalo as a kid, how did you get into music? What made you want to be a singer? Uh really wasn't a choice. Uh, it was uh, just uh, you know, I didn't like wake up one day and say, Ooh, "I think I'll be a singer," you know. I was born a singer, I'll die one. But I mean, talk about, <laughs> talk about like, you know, what your early influences are when you first started performing. Uh, well, I was the youngest, so I spent the first five years with my mom, just me and my mom. And she was a lover of music and would listen to the Mills Brothers, Sinatra, uh, the Ink Spots, uh, Dean Martin, you know, standards and stuff like that. And uh, I can't imagine <laughs> me as, as a, you know, four years old or something. I was like, you know, the mask bouncing off the ceilings and stuff. I was, you know, I was wiry. And the stuff that must have come out of my mouth of me mimicking sounds. And my mother just probably looked at me and went, <laughs> I don't know what the heck it is, but, you know, it's something. And she wrote out, you know, lyrics for me for uh, songs. And she uh, bought me a ventriloquist record. So you could, you could try to make, you know, talk about laying your lips. <laughs> so she, uh, she supported it, but she really didn't quite understand it. And so but how old were you when you were in your first? Were those uh, that my mother, like, like the Mills Brothers, if you listen to the, that music, it's really, really good music. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's old or, you know, not. But so when did you get in your first band? Uh, well, I did my first gig when I was I was five years old, actually. It was a talent contest when I was in kindergarten. Uh, I did my first gig on the same stage with my band years later. But in kindergarten, everybody had to bring something in, you know, a, a record, of a phonograph player, a wigs, guitars, whatever, and they put it all on a table. And even at five years old, I looked at this table, I knew exactly what wig I wanted, knew exactly what guitar I wanted, you know, and of course, of course, because I wanted it uh, the way certain uh, scholastic places work, you know, they fought me on it. So I got the worst wig, the worst guitar, and I ended up being John Lennon, and we did I Want to Hold Your Hand, uh, and a talent, you know, to, to uh, the record, which wasn't even the Beatles, it was uh, probably a bunch of New York session guys, they got the right chord, the Beatles songs, and it was just four, you know, heads, but it was actually not even the Beatles. But that was my first gig. And then uh, years later, I had my first band. I can recall. I don't even know if we had a name. At the uh, same stage, my grammar school. 
So, but I mean, were you playing around in uh, Buffalo for a while? Well, no, I used to uh, jam with Talos. Right, now Talos was Billy Sheehan's yeah. band, which was legendary in Buffalo. You know, Paul Varga. I used to sneak in because I, you know, the, at the time, the drinking age was 18 and I wasn't 18 yet. But I was tall <clears throat> and could sing Zeppelin. So, <laughs> and um, I, from as far as I can remember, I was the only guy that ever went up and jammed with Talos. You know, all of a sudden this kid gets up there. Uh, so I did that, but uh, there wasn't that many places to play. He and right. she's. McVans, I played the, I mean, my father, my parents went to McVans, you know, when, when uh, they were young. And uh, gosh, everybody, I saw Luke Graham play there with the Black Sheep, came out, put his foot on the monitor, grabbed the mic, he sang one line. And I went, that one, damn, he, that guy can sing. <laughs> yeah. But now, so in 1976, you decided to go to California. What was your uh, what was your thinking? What what made you do that? Uh, well, my brother Dennis was in a, a place called Zabno. It was a music store, Tom Zabno, and Claude Snell, who uh, was was the keyboard player in Dio. Uh, for he played with Ronnie for a while, and Joey Belfury came in, and. They were looking for a singer. And my, like I said, my brother Dennis was there, and Dennis said, uh, well, I know the best singer in Buffalo. They go, well, who? He's my little brother. <laughs> so from that, Mark McGavro, uh, who was a guitar player, was the, the, the gentleman, God rest him, because he passed away a couple years ago. But uh, he's the one I left with, and we left in a 1972 black Chevy van, no spare tire, I had $140, my Les Paul, and a bag with some clothes in it. <laughs> and, and got in the truck and <clears throat> drove from Buffalo to St. Petersburg, Florida, where Mark's parents were. Hung out there and then got on Route 10 all the way to Los Angeles. Texas took like a month, I swear. <laughs> it's pretty but, insane. Uh, and we made it. I made it. Uh, Safe and sound. I, mean, I got out of there too. I know a lot of people that didn't. And so when you so when you got to LA, what did you start doing? What what was uh what was the beginning of your music career there? Well, <laughs> the first gig I did in Hollywood was at Gazari's, upstairs at Gazari's, and we were called Crown. It was me, Joey Belfury, Claude Schnell, Mark McGavro, and we uh, we were so loud they unplugged us. Wow. <laughs> Which you know, it's like the uh, the first write up I ever got uh, in Hollywood was uh, we were opening up for uh, Black Oak Arkansas, and uh, it said in, in opening the show uh, there was a band called Bad Axe, which I was in a band with Dana Strum, Bad Axe. And most interesting was the lead vocalist Louis Merlino when he wasn't using profanity to arouse the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they have something written, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a, a humble beginning. Um, okay, so you so you were work, you, you worked in LA for a long time, seven or eight years before you decided to go to New York City. Now, yeah, what, was, what makes you make that change? Well, I ran its course. I did. Did, uh, tried to do the thing with Mark and, um, and Crown, that didn't happen. And then uh, I was selling office, I was trying to sell office supplies, I couldn't give it away. And there was a girl that was Danny Johnson's wife, who was a guitar player, who played Rod Stewart, had a band called Axis, played with uh, John Kay, <clears throat> excuse me, stuff for years. Well, his wife, uh, worked where I worked and through that connection, uh, gosh, all kinds of stuff, McParmont like FC and, and had a band that rehearsed right behind where Danny lived. Uh, Soothsayer was the name of that band. And, Is he from uh, what's that? 
I said, easy for you to say. Yeah, and I can remember uh, Ken Huddleston, who was a guitar player, uh, Frank Ferrana, uh, AKA Nikki Six, shows up uh, to, we used to show up to rehearsals because he lived in Burbank and near Burbank. And, <laughs> and he would come to rehearsals and Ken Huddleston would say, you know, tell him, go home, man, and rehearse because you suck. <laughs> Uh, and then you, uh, years later, Frank Nicky was in uh, a band called London, and they broke up right before Molly Crew. And he called me and asked me to join the band. And I said, I said, Frank, I said, you know, it's really not what I do. So I turned it down. Which you know, Vince Neil, I'm not. I, you know, I used to see him in the uh, Rock Candy cover band, the Wood Sound in Monrovia, California. You know, Louis, uh, ar around this, that same time, I'm assuming before you go to New York is when uh, Spinal Tap comes around, the movie This is Spinal Tap. Okay, Spinal Tap. That was... That was in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I was playing with Modern Design, and it was uh, me... Ronnie Mancuso, Dane Strum, and Joe DePompe on drums. And uh, somehow we were up for the uh, opening act. There was uh, supposedly an opening act written into the script. And Christopher, uh, Harry Shearer and Michael McKeon came to Madame Wong's West to see the band, Modern Design. When they came to see the band, they saw me and they went, well, this is Ricky, the rock Adonis from San Francisco, <laughs> you know? Then I had, I had a character who was supposed to replace Nigel Tufnell, which once they saw the band, then that was approached to, uh, you know, which, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've sung and played with legends, I've sung on platinum records, I've done all these amazing things, you know, hung out with uh, my influences that made me a singer. And the thing that people are impressed with out of all of it is Spinal Tap. <laughs> yeah, the, you, you replaced Nigel Tufnell. Yeah, um, and, and it's funny because I, I cut out of the movie and the, the Jim Zullo, who was the, the gentleman that did all the Beggars and Thieves album covers, uh, helped me bring my Marshall cabinet uh, down because I got the tape on a Tuesday and I had to record on Wednesday. And, they, and so I worked the whole song out. I worked the solo out. And Jim Zillow helped me bring the amp down. So I get one pass, and that's all I got. And then Chris Gaster, somebody goes, well, no, or Michael McKeon says, well, now he's got to sing it. And I was like, wait a minute. Nobody said anything about singing, but, you know, I was a singer before I was a guitar player. So I said, oh, all right, give me the, give me the lyrics. Threw the lyrics up, I said, press the red button. They press the red button, one pass. Well, you know, Louis, so we, what so we, we, we were looking for was uh, me to mess up or me to look like bad, but there was no way I was gonna show up to like a session and and not be prepared and not be ready. Give me that just give me one shot, that's all I got. And well, so we should so so I called Jim Zulo out of the blues years later just to say hello and he goes wow it's really funny that you called because we were just uh, listening or watching you last night I said, what are you talking about it was uh, the dvd spinal tap i said what <laughs> so number 13 in the outtakes nigel's yeah, replacement. I mean, it's pretty amazing louis so you, you you shot a scene in the movie this is spinal tap um where they're looking for somebody to replace uh nigel Tofnell. And uh, Michael McKean's character, Davidson Hubbins, his girlfriend knows you, Ricky the uh, Rock Adonis from San Francisco. And they, uh, they bring you in um, to, uh, to try out. Well, let's, we should take a look, Louie. We should, we should reminisce. Hold on. We're going to reminisce. Yeah. All right, here we go. Hold on, Louie. Look at my face.
in the San Francisco yeah. you'll ever find, okay? And, and I thought it was a great idea. Uh, I don't know, it no script. So here you are, Louie, with Spinal Tap. So obviously you were uh, you were too uh, popular with the ladies. They had to clip you before after the first show. Obviously. <laughs> hey, so it didn't make sense. And they really yeah. wanted like clubs, you know, they wanted, but I didn't give them a chance. They gave me one pass at singing, one pass at the guitar. That was it. Do you still have that guitar? Yes, I sure do. It was my brother Dennis's originally. I used to pick the lock. I used to he used to work and I used to get out of school and I would run home and uh, I'd take a Marshall head out of one of the cabinets out of the box. He'd put it in the box and then I would pick the lock on the guitar case <laughs> and I would set it up in the hall and play, just jam. And my mother would say, he's coming home soon. I said, yeah, I know. And I would play forever, you know, long and, and I would have to put you know, everything back exactly the way it was in my chin. My brother Dennis is very particular about his stuff. God rest him. But, uh, yeah. yeah well, guitar. That's great that you have it. Like you said, so. The Ronnie Spector as well, same guitar forever. Nice. Well, so that scene was deleted from the movie. Obviously, it didn't make it. Um, movie is probably running long. But so, like you said, it is on the uh, extended DVD. You can catch it in the bonus tracks. Yeah. And it's on YouTube, as we just watched. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's move ahead to New York City. 1983, you make the move to New York. Yeah, well, what happened was um, before that, why I left was I uh, was working in Pasha Studios and with Mark Stein from Vanilla Fudge. I co-wrote a song on uh, the Vanilla Fudge record that Jeff Beck played lead guitar on, a song called Jealousy, which is uh, was pretty cool. But... And his wife managed me at one point, his wife and Wendy Dio, uh, Ronnie James Dio's wife. But in, in the interim, he basically stole my band. And, I, you know, uh, something I pretty much took from the beginning, uh, he came and just, you know, basically stole my band. And I went, all right, see ya. I left LA. And, uh, I had a girlfriend who lived in New York and moved to New York. Right by the World Trade Center, 176 Broadway. And so... The World Trade Center. <laughs> so tell me about your audition for a band called Danger Street. 
Yeah, and well, you... no, he didn't date, just speaking. We were, uh, it was Steve Holly who played with Paul McCartney. When Paul McCartney got busted for pot in Japan, Steve Holly was the drummer. Uh, Ian McDonald played uh, sax on Bang a Gong. He was in King Crimson, 21st century schizo man. He said he did in one take. <laughs> okay. Um, and he played sax on Bang a Gong and he was in Foreigner. Just, you know, not that he didn't do that much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we tried to get a record deal, played the cat club, the play, you know, and only gig that I ever did that I had stuff thrown at me. Wow. I had, yeah, I was in, uh, uh, New Haven, Connecticut and I never, I never experienced that before. And I kind of freaked me out. So I'll come off stage and I'm, I remember sitting in a chair and have a guy that played one of the Beatles. And the guy that played, you know, sax and bang and gong, like, and I'm like, I said, you know, we sucked. I was like freaking out because I never had anything thrown. And they're just like looking at me. I was like, eh. you know, I was very upset. Because I know who wants to suck. <laughs> now that same band, uh, Desmond Child, who now is one of the great, most famous songwriters of all time. Uh, he auditioned for the same role as you, the as singer of that band, right? He came up to me at the cat club and says, you're Louis Merlino. I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you know? He, he, he said, well, I auditioned for uh, for Ian McDonald's band. And, and obviously I didn't get it. You did. So it was nice to meet you, Desmond. And who knew, you know, years later, I was singing everything he did. Yeah, and that, that really that, begins. That almost didn't happen as well because of uh, the first time I worked for Desmond was a, a demo, right? And he was, it was a whole different time in his life where he was in a whole different place. I'll just say that. And uh, I went and sang the song, and there was one line that he had originally sung me uh, the demo. And being a singer as long as I have, I know this to be true that there's sometimes you're on a microphone, you'll do something and you, you'll do it once and you could try. And I did, I tried for like 30 you know, minutes to try to get this line just like he did it. And I, then I started to explain, Des, you know, the, something in here is going, and then you go this and it comes out and it never happens the same way again. That's why you always press the red button. And the next day, I couldn't even talk. I was like, oh. he's like beat me up, you know? So I said, I'll never, you know, I'll never work for him again. Screw that. And then it was like Friday night, put my eye blinds on. It was, I don't know, about midnight or something. Nothing, not a whole lot going on. And my service calls, it says emergency phone call from John Waite and Desmond Child, the hit factory. First of all, I knew John. Uh, from previous things um, and and Desmond I knew because I had done this demo and I was like okay I'm, first of all I'm not ex that excited about John and and Desmond didn't beat me up but I said something in my head said Louis you should do this I got up did my scales took a shower went and got in the cab went down the hit factory walked in the studio <clears throat> There's John Wade and, and Dead and around. They've been there for hours. I walk in all fresh and, you know, showered. And, and uh, it was the very last thing to be sung on uh, on that uh, that record. Yeah, what's that song called, Louis? Called, uh, I was trying to think of it. Uh, I walked up in a sweat, darkness all around me. I was caught in a sweat, another room. Uh, this, this time is hard for lovers. Is that it? Time to hop a lover down to me and you. Nothing we can do is gonna tell us what's well true. These times are hard for lovers. I believe in you. Yeah, that's it. And, and what's and funny, Louis? I, I did every record, including his own. And what's funny, Louis? That, so that's the beginning. You know, uh, of the session songs where you you can he if you listen to that track, you can hear your voice loud and clear. The 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 days of a session singer are kind of gone now. You know, people uh, well, we have auto tune and 
Well, yeah, but you could. Here's a, yeah, you know, auto tune. I mean, you, you auto tune used to be uh, you know you'd slow the tape down. <laughs> the two is tape. It's like VSO, you know. Um, you're still gonna have to be able to sing, you know, or you know, unless you're just gonna be a machine. And after this whole craziness in the world that's going on, people are gonna be really starving for something real. And if you're a singer and a performer, the only shot that you've got, because the zippity doo dah, you know, mm -hmm. thing ain't gonna fly that that you know that far anymore. It's gonna come back to moving people and, and people being affected by a song, you know. I was uh, back home in Buffalo uh, uh, visiting my family and I went and jammed at this bar and with an acoustic thing. So I played uh, Thank You by Zeppelin and I finished the song and came off and this girl comes up to me and she's, she's crying. I'm like, and she said, that was great. She said, we played that at my wedding. <laughs> I made, I made the girl cry by singing this song, right? And if you can do that, then you got a shot. If, if you if you have to rely on auto tune, and then I got to tell you, when music actually becomes music again, if it does, you know, who knows? It might be aliens might start making music if they're not already. Who knows? Yeah, uh, but the uh, the point I'm making though, Louis, is that. The uh, back then, all these big name bands of singers would hire another voice to be their session guy, and and Desmond Child, who wrote and produced, would bring you in on a lot of his sessions. Uh, yeah, would, yeah, he would give me my own track and my own mic. So, which is produce. rare, right? Oh, very. Yeah. Well, because if you if you're singing in a group, usually it's on one or two mics, and you got like six singers or something, however big a group three to six, whatever. And basically on, on one mic, uh, or maybe, the, you know, the circle pattern around the mic. Uh, I've never known somebody to isolate a track so they can mix it louder other than my own situation, which I, there's, <laughs> I found that I did a thing, a Shocker uh, soundtrack, uh, the song Shocker, it was Desmond Child and uh, Paul Stanley. And on YouTube, there's uh, somebody did a remix. I don't know if it's Arthur Payson, but it was, it was the engineer, Sir Arthur Payson. But in the middle of the song, they break the song down. And then all of a sudden, there's a fade in, and it's all me. <laughs> and it's like, it's like tracks. Of, we will have the power. And it's just tracks. And there it is. And, and well, it's, it, it's a, that's, not, that's not the track. Uh, it's a special track, but it it just all the music disappears and it's just a bunch of tracks of my voice. And I'm like, <laughs> who did that? Well, and now Shocker was a Shocker was a West. I'm sorry. Shocker was a West Craven horror movie, and right. uh, and Desmond Child had a lot of involvement in songs on it. And you sang several songs, at least vocals on a lot of it, right? Well, I, yeah, the Iggy Pop uh, thing. Uh, I need, a, I need a love transfusion, and it's love I'm losing. Oh, yeah. Uh, and did you do a sword in the stone? Is that one that you did? Uh, no. Wait, who's that? <laughs> I can't. I can't remember. It was like two or three, though. I know you're accredited for on that one. Yeah, I, I remember doing Iggy Pop. I remember doing, uh, well, the Shocker one and. The other one I don't remember so long. Yeah. But so so at that point, let, let's talk about some of the other things that Desmond uh, brought you in to work on. Share was one that you did a lot of. I did two Share records, yeah. Uh, she, uh, she came to the studio once. Uh, those big glasses, you know, the big sunglasses. And she had like purple spandex pants on her, her real hair. She didn't say a word. And, uh, <laughs> She just came in and just sort of listened and then left. Uh, and Desmond would tell me she was real difficult to get on the mic, you know? <laughs> Sometimes it's not so easy, you know? 
Yeah. And so what's funny about some of these share songs is that, you know, you go and sing your part, but some of these songs have Bon Jovi on it and all kinds of other people that you never even come across when you're recording your part. No, they did. They were done different songs. <clears throat> like that song, like the Bon Jovi one uh, was done, you know, uh, I don't know if Desmond even did that one. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, you, there's, some, there's some credits that have your voice on some of these tracks. So I don't know if they used uh, something else no. you said. Yeah, I, I just tell you, I don't remember how many tracks. I remember doing the Iggy Pop one. I remember the Shocker one. And, uh... um, so just to name a couple more, well, Don Johnson of Miami Vice fame. Yeah. Right? How did that come about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, the I think uh, the most money I was ever no, it was uh, Barry Manilow, Don Johnson. Yeah, tough record. Uh, did it with Joe Lynn Turner, uh, a bunch of singers, but Joe was the most famous one. Good singer, good guy too. And then, uh, what about Alice Cooper? Alice Cooper yeah. trash. It was my first concert. You know, uh, and there's only two people I've ever seen really do this just walk out and not speak a word. And the whole audience and everything was right there. And all they had to do was walk out. Just look at the audience. And that was the first time this Alice Cooper just walked out. And it was like Buffalo Memorial Auditorium. Walked out and took command of the whole auditorium. Didn't even say a word, just walked out right there. And then here in Las Vegas, I saw Frank Sinatra coming out with his heels, you know. <laughs> and he walked out, that's all he had to do. The charisma and the, and the room owned it just by walking out. I was like, I wanna be able to try to do that. <laughs> that's something to, to look, you know, try to do. But so on that record, you sing on the song House of Fire and then also uh, Poison. Yeah, and the thing is, is when, you know, I mean, I, I mimicked Dallas Cooper, you know, in bands from the time I was like 12 or something. And then when, you know, years later, you're singing on a microphone and you look over the, the guy that you were mimicking and, and, you know, that made you want to be a singer uh, is on a microphone right next to you. <laughs> and you go, yeah, this is pretty cool. I hope everybody's life is like that. And now, so, so that song, uh, Poison, that becomes a pretty big hit. And uh, rumor is that your voice was <laughs> touring with Alice Cooper for quite some years. Well, uh, you know, I happened to do it on House of Fire. <clears throat> they're called uh, TV tracks, what they're called. And, I, and usually when you make records, back in the day when they made records, they would make what they call TV tracks, which, which would be the basic track. And there might be a, a guitar ticket out where the guitar player might play with the track. And Alice or whoever would, would sing. Now it came up I mean, on YouTube and it came up and I was like, wow, I didn't know I was on the, you know, American Music Awards. I got to put the in my resume. <laughs> Here's some live shows. Sounds like. Here's some live shows years later where I think uh, you were still singing Poison, whether you knew it or not. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, there's a, there was a change in, in the union in SAG and AFTRA which are now both together. And a couple of years ago, I started getting uh, checks, royalty checks for singing on those songs, which is, you know, what, two, three years ago? <laughs> 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 but actually, that's a couple of zeros. Uh, it was quite a long time ago, but because of, uh, it's called, uh, it's got a really weird name, but they, you know, they come uh, once a year, after the first quarter, I called the union and I said, so is this going to come every quarter? <laughs> and then she says, no, I said, well, I'll take it. But, but, you know, when you do something 30 years ago and all of a sudden, you, you know. Yeah. Waited three hours for Darling Love to show up that session, the Joan Jett session. Right. A little liar, right? And yeah. Well, I uh, hate myself for loving you. And a little liar, yeah. And uh, yeah, and so the great Darlene Love. The song that brought Alice Cooper back. And he was, he, he, 
real nice guy. When I worked with him, because I mean, years ago when he did a record, Danny Johnson played on, and Richie Podler produced uh, Three Dog Night and Steppenwolf. And Alice was in a whole different place. <laughs> but when I worked with him, he was a born again Christian, you know, and Diet Coke. And one night it was at the limelight, and the VI place was upstairs, as you well know. Mm-hmm. And I was on the other side of the room, and Alice walked across the room, came to me to say hello. <laughs> I'm like, well, wait a minute, man, you're Alice Cooper. I'm supposed to, you know, it's supposed to be the opposite. But that's the kind of guy Alice Cooper was. Tell me about Kiss, uh, Louis. Kiss. Okay. That was 2000, of course. Uh, the audition uh, was uh, the Hit Factory, got a name. And uh, I get a call to go to the Hit Factory to meet Gene and Paul. So the audition was I walked in. The controller in the studio met him. Actually, I walked through the whole studio where the kind of big cutting room is, and Gene sat where Gene said it's flicking picks. He was on the other side of the, the cutting room and he's flicking picks at me. I'm like, come on, man, I don't even know you. And Paul is real cool. And so we get in the control room and they play uh, the song called Rock Hard and X and Sex. We play the song, and Gene goes, you sing that? I go, yeah. Got the gig. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know. And that was that was that was the uh, you know the audition. Can you sing that? Yeah. <laughs> well, and your voice is all over that too. X and sex and and rock hard. You know, you can hear your voice very clearly. When I first saw the video, and I saw my voice coming out of Paul Stanley's mouth. I mean, I've had people, you know, because singing. People will compare you time to time with different people. And there has been, because of certain range of, that you sing in, you know, people have said, Paul Stanley, it's like, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's not, not what I was, you know, striving for. It's not my, you know, generation. It was, it was like Steve Marriott and stuff, Ian Gill and stuff like that. It was my thing. <laughs> now, uh, uh, and, and another, another huge song that you sang on, how can we be lovers if we can't be friends? By Michael Bolton. That's right. How was that? Well, that was uh, I just uh, Michael. God love him. It uh, that was the only session that I had ever ng, which is no good. I went and initially did it as a favor to Desmond, uh, and sang the whole song. And, you know, Michael's Michael. Everybody is what they are. And um, some people are just more polite than others, I guess. <laughs> and nicer than other people. And, uh, you know, I, I worked and did jingles with them and sessions and stuff. And um, I got called back because it doesn't put a modulation on the end of the song. And I, I NG'd it. Only, only session I ever turned down. The only other time I turned it down was a, a slaughter rip of a jingle. And singers, I gotta tell you, don't do this. You know, any coast. But it, once again, it wasn't something that I thought was right for me to be, you know, sonic, I sound like. So I, I called another singer and I gave it to him. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, well, so- the irony is, is ridiculous. Well, and so we should talk about at that time while you're living in New York, you're you're making a living singing jingles, uh, Snickers, Mountain Dew. There's a famous uh, Diet Pepsi commercial with Michael J. Fox played during the Super Bowl. All those commercials are you singing the songs. Yeah, Royal Caribbean is down payment on my house. See? <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a time when jingle singing, you could make a living. Oh, you could sing for half an hour and make twenty thousand dollars. I mean, there, and, was, uh, there was guys who were like Mighty Joe Serrano was making a million too. I I didn't do that well, you know. I had to fight for every gig. I except one time I did six Snickers finals television commercials. Snickers satisfies you three times, six times. That's all I had to do. 
And I felt really uncomfortable because every other session, every other thing I've ever done, it's like, really got to, I got to earn it. You know, I got I to win this one. And just to have one hand, you know, six final spots handed you, I felt like uncomfortable. Scott said, okay, who's the producer of the Giga the House? He said, just remember all the ones you did get. And I said, where's the pen? <laughs> I said, my tax form. I said, I'm out of here. Said, There's go. one Snickers commercial where you sang uh, Satisfaction from the Stones. That's right. And that's another great story. Yes. Andrew Luga Oldham, who was the uh, gentleman that used to, that locked uh, Mick Jagger and uh, Keith Richards in a room to write songs. I knew him through a, a girlfriend of mine, uh, Catherine, uh, and hung out with uh, Andrew. He used to come to Beggars gigs. I actually have Andrew who go them videotaping a Beggars and Thieves gig at Sanctuary on, on 8th Street. Um, and so I get this call and no one ever, has ever covered a Rolling Stones song up to that point uh, as a commercial. I had, would have been the first one. And so I went in and sang this jingle and I walk in the studio and who's producing it, but the guy that produced the Rolling Stones and locked him in a room, the, my friend, mm -hmm. Andy Golden. So uh, unfortunately, I thought I was gonna do really well, you know, but it only ran in Canada. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's noteworthy because I don't think the Rolling Stones are that keen on uh, having their songs. Commercial, yeah. So, okay, Louis, so, you're in New York, you have this amazing career, you're singing on all the Desmond's records, tons of hits, you got the jingles going. And so then comes Beggars and Thieves. Um, with Ron Mancuso, who was in the band Modern Design with you way back in LA. So it's kind of funny how it all comes together. Well, and, I did uh, the thing and then it got to a point where I said, you know what, I, I did this, it was so easy with Ronnie. I said, Ronnie, you come to New York. I said, we'll get a record deal and we'll make a record. I said, I'll make you more money than you made, you've ever probably made and we'll get a deal. The first year he made like $85,000 and I think we did nine gigs and had a deal. I wish I had friends like me. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, it worked out, and, you know. Only well, and what's interesting though is you sang sessions on all these Atlantic albums. You know, a lot of the bands were on Atlantic Records. Now you get signed to Atlantic Records by the guy who signed uh, Led Zeppelin, right? Uh, I, I, I'm an Erdogan. Uh, me and Ronnie went up to Atlantic Records in his office. And he was the main Turk. There's uh, uh, I'm an Erdogan. And... He was playing air guitar to kill me a song on the first beggars record. And I tapped Ronnie and I said, okay, moments in life, here's one of them. <laughs> the guy is, you know, Arif Martin was the other one uh, who uh, produced the Bee Gees and he's the second Turk in line up there. And Aretha Franklin and stuff. And, uh, Actually, I before the beggars deal, I turned down record deals for Atlantic Records uh, with uh, Arif Martin because Joe Martin's son wanted to co-produce the record, and I was working with Donnie Kisselbach, who played bass uh, with Rick Derringer and uh, Flo and Eddie for years, and we went in this meeting and uh, he like agreed to do you know. I didn't have a problem with him co managing you know, co-producing. Our A&R man was Ahmed Erdogan's godson. Uh, the uh, co-producers, the second, in, you know, head Turk in the Atlantic Records. I'm thinking, oh, well, that's stacking the deck, man. That's the thing you should do. So we do this meeting. He reads everything in, this, in the meeting. And the door shuts and goes, I ain't doing any of that. I was like, what do you mean? So... A little time goes by, and uh, Vicky Germaze, who was Arif Martin's, uh, no, uh, Arif Martin's assistant, and she says, Why is uh, Stephen Weiss, who signed Led Zeppelin, 
trying to lock up your record deal. And I said, what? So, you know, uh, I come from a place where I learned one thing. If somebody does something, tells you three things. They've done it before. They know, but they know how to do it. They've done it before and they will do it again. So I couldn't see going and spending all this time that I put into this already entering to some entered into something that with someone that I don't trust. So I went up to Atlantic Records and Arif Martin. It was like five or six people in the room, Ricky Gervais and Joe Martin was there. And I said, Mr. Martin, I'm not going to waste your time. I'm not going to waste mine. I can't take the record deal. <laughs> I had a, a whole room of people just looking at me like, wow, no one's ever done that before. And that's when I called Ronnie and said, Ronnie, come, I'll make you more money. We'll get a deal. Like I said, made a bunch of dough. Nine gigs later, I had three times the record deal was originally offered to me less than a year before on the same label. And I had a bidding war. It was one of the last dinosaur guys to actually, yeah, people don't even know what a bidding war is. It was Atlantic, epic, Atlantic, epic. And then it gets like, to the point where you could just, everything you just go and be gone and, and disappear. Because you pushed, you pushed it too far, but you gotta push it, especially those. I days. think that that might have been one of the things that hurt beggars and thieves, because when you guys came out, hard rock bands, hair bands, metal bands were were getting signed constantly, and a lot of labels would sign them because they didn't uh, they didn't want someone else to sign them. And I remember uh, Eric Martin from Mr. Big telling me, who was also on Atlantic, that they were about to get dropped. You know, Atlantic really didn't put any effort into them, and then the song "To Be With You" came out. And then all of a sudden they were happy to have Mr. Big. Um, and so you guys were really competing, even though you Beggars and Thieves was not a traditional, uh, this, this was not a, a, a hair metal band or a glam band. This is an old style rock band, but I think you kind of got lumped in and maybe got lost in that shuffle. What do you think? Lumped in, it, it, Atlantic, like I said, we had a bidding war. I already had a record deal waiting on Epic Records, okay? Uh, and Atlantic wouldn't let us go. They they were dropping bands, Baton Rouge, and I mean, all these bands, I mean, left and right. But for six <laughs> months, they held on to it because contractually I signed the contract and I was bound to it. And that six months was the same amount of time when, you know, grunge started happening and the 80s thing, pretty much like everything else, get to get, well, it gets good because everything runs its course. And that six months pretty much destroyed everything we worked for. Yeah, I mean, you guys had a lot going for you too. Uh, Q Prime Management, who had you know some of the biggest bands. My attorney signed The Who, uh, the, my producers, Nick's Appetite Destruction, mm -hmm. uh, I, the, my managers, uh, managed Def Leppard, Metallica, Queens Wright, uh, gosh, everybody, Tesla. I had the best songwriters with Holly Knight, Desmond Child, Diane Warren, Jim Valance, you know, um, the best of everything. I had, uh, did demos with Bobby Shinar and Hugh McDonald. Uh, and, uh, and so Beggars and Thieves shot a music video. And it's funny you shot your video at the Cat Club, which is probably where I, where I first met you. But um, it's funny how your life kind of came in this full circle of, you know, playing shows at the Cat Club in the 70s and, and meeting people before, you know, heading out. And now you've got your own band. You're shooting this video. Uh, Phil, Phil Susan from Ozzy's band uh, was on bass at that time. Yep. Uh, and uh, and you played uh, you did some shows with Don Dockin you did some shows with uh, you did acoustic shows with Tesla. Um, now so the the first Beggars and Thieves record it's one of these records that when people hear it they really love it. Un you know unfortunately not everyone uh, got to hear it but now you can go anywhere you can go on Spotify or YouTube or Amazon and, and hear it. And then you guys did um, you you did two or three follow up records right. Yeah, the second record uh, we did with Jim Valance and uh, Paul Northfield in Vancouver. Uh, it's a great record. Look what you create, it's a great record. Um, 
once again, this record that did the most effect was the first record because when it came out and with the internet, I get to hear people say, you know, when I was 15, I would listen to No More Broken Dreams and, you know, I'd feel good. And it, it, once again, you know, it's the same thing I said before, you, you're affecting people. And this is something that, and you know, that I get messages, I, you know, I, I have the CD in my car still, you know, and you know, the, the fans that we did have were hardcore fans. And for whatever reason, No More Broken Dreams was a song that affected quite a few kids in, you know, at that age. And it was a timing thing. It's just, once again, not quite, you know, lined up. Yeah, that was the title, the intro track to the album. And then you also open your um, shows with. But uh, so you, you you eventually you came out to Las Vegas. Yeah, well, I got to New York because I mean, once again, like I said, everything runs its course. And in New York, unless you, you know, you're know you making a whole lot of money coming in, you can't live in New York. <laughs> well, I saw where you were living, Louis. I mean, right over Central Park, you know. Uh, Last apartment was before the Central Park. I could stick my head out the window and I could see the park. Um, Not cheap. You know, you tell them, oh, so we got two forty Central Parks out. <laughs> you want to come see the apartment the hard way? <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, people are funny with people are impressed with watch it wow it's a watch i got a seiko you know i got a, you know it tells us just as good time and it was cost mm -hmm. 50 dollars <laughs> and so anyway. uh, since you've been in las vegas and, and ron mancuso was out in las vegas as well you did do some um, more beggars and thieves stuff you did some shows overseas you guys made another record out on frontiers um so you've you've kept it You've kept it going and put out amazing music, um, you know, and so hopefully people will go and take a look at that because it, it really some great stuff. Yeah, and then there's uh, the last one. There's a live record that's not out yet um, that we did a while ago, actually. It's, uh, it's in the can. We just haven't put it out yet. So that'll happen. Yeah, I mean, no one could predict also that, uh, like I said, this would have been the anniversary, uh, or last year would have been the anniversary of the first Beggars and Thieves record. Um, not sure how many years, 20 years, something like that? Uh, we pretty much was 89. Right. Uh, yeah, the record came out in 89, in the 90, then we did the second one in 92. Because I remember right. talking to Ron about, you know, uh, some kind of 20th anniversary thing, but of course, everybody's plans um, change to do anything. So. Come on. <laughs> hey. Was that me or you? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but so Louis, I mean, you've, you've, you've had an amazing career and you haven't stopped. You still play here in Las Vegas. Uh, you still work on uh, your own music. You well know, I mean, I did the whole thing with you for I don't know, three, almost three years. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, running a thing called Sin City Sinners here in Las Vegas, and Louie came out and was our lead singer for, uh, yeah, like you said, for at least three years. And then also uh, we had you in the, in the band with Jimmy Crespo from Aerosmith. Um, right. You sang for that for a, a long time, uh, you know, as much as we can get out of it. And Sebastian Bach, you brought, you brought a lot of... A lot uh, Kip of Winger. I'm yeah, you, you did the Winger show with us? Yep. I've and, known, I've known Kip, wow. Uh, since I sang at Fiona's stuff with Bo Hill. Wow, long time yeah. ago. <laughs> and then I think you did a show. We had Matt Sorum. You did that one with us, right? Yep. Nice yeah, guy. So we, Very nice guy. Yeah, he was good. Plays in his so, uh, yeah, no, so you, uh, you've, stayed, you've stayed busy, Louie. And, uh, and your voice is, you know, going to be out there forever. I mean, I think people have no idea how many commercials and things that they've seen or records that they've seen and not known that they were hearing your voice. Yeah. It's funny because I, I periodically check, you know, the internet for things because stuff that I completely forgot that I even did will pop up and I'll come, well, I completely forgot I did that. And, and that's kind of the life, the life of a session singer is you go in and you record something in an afternoon. It doesn't necessarily mean 
that you know that this is going to end up being a, a massive hit? No. I mean, if, when you're working with someone like Desmond and, you know, and Holly Knight and, and people that just do nothing but write hits, right. uh, you know, your chances are better. Um, you know, and some songs are better than others and easier to do than others. Yeah. But, and uh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, and so you, it's been a, a pretty insane career. You know, um, Desmond Child also, he had a solo album. You sang on his record as well. Uh, yeah. Do you think that Desmond was sort of a frustrated uh, singer? Do you, do you think that maybe. The Rouge, for, you know, they did, I don't know, two or three records, and they mm -hmm. just had three, and I think they were doing a recording. I, I've kept in touch with Desmond. Uh, and uh, he's still. He's, he's still doing it. And now his kids are grown, so he's getting back in. And who knows, you know, one phone call and a song did, you know, change things. Yeah. Like, I, I, when I, I contacted him, once, I said, Dad, you know, you got any, like, ballads just laying on the floor? You're not doing anything with Send them my way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we should point out to people who might not know that, that Desmond Child wrote um, the biggest I mean, Bon Jovi songs. Yeah. Living on a prayer mm -hmm. and everything in between. Living La Vida Loca. I mean, Joan Jett, Dallas Cooper, Cher, Bonnie Tyler, uh, Peter Wolf, Jimmy Barnes. All these people you sang on their records too Bonnie Tyler, Jimmy Barnes, every one of them. Yeah. A lot of singing, man. The two yeah. slave machines. And you, you know you're singing for like ten hours, <laughs> but you know it's those that, those days are in books now. You got to read about that stuff. Yeah, or turn on YouTube and, and see someone talk about it who experienced it. Oh, hey, there's an idea. <laughs> All right, Louis. Well, I'm glad that we got to talk a little about your career because it, it is one of those careers that is so hard. You you can't say, well, Louis sang on this record or Louis did that. You know, because well, it's been such a wide career. Like if I'm talking to someone and I, like if music would be playing, you know, in a, in a bar or something and a song will go by and I'll say, well, I sang on that. The next song will be the guy that's playing bass sang him, or played on my record. And then the next song will be like, well, I had the same managers as this band. It's just like one after another. It's like it becomes, and I start, you know, saying I did this. Uh, it's to a point where I say, just stop, because it sounds like I'm full of crap. You know, the six degrees of Louis Merlino. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I appreciate but, uh, that. Yeah, Louis, thank you. I'm glad, you know, I'm glad we got to uh, catch up. It's, it's a funny thing. This time, you know, no one's able to do anything. And so this is the much as we see of each other, you know. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's become this odd virtual world that, but at least we get to share with other people who might need some entertainment. Yeah, and wait for Rod Sterling to pop out somewhere. Sure feels that way. All right, Louis. Well, uh, I would. I would ask uh, Louis, this is where we would plug something and say, where can people see you? But the answer is they can't. Uh, yeah, you can't be seen anywhere other than uh, right here, something like this. All right, put on those Beggars and Thieves records. People can do that and, and get to hear it. So, all right, Louis, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll be out playing and talking again soon. Stay safe, everybody.